Hi everyone, thank you so much for coming down. And it's a pleasant surprise to see so many of you turning up for a design session. And by far, uh, this is the biggest crowd I have seen in India and across uh, gathering together for a design session. So a big round of applause for you guys. This also shows that you know, uh, our sensitivity towards user experience is growing day by day, and we are understanding how critical it is to our businesses and our users. So let's get started with this. But before that, uh, I'm a user experience designer, uh, so I'd like to first understand who are my users, who are my audience right now. How many students are I over here? Wow, that's a lot of you. Isn't, isn't G-Day a good excuse to miss classes? Wow, look at that. OK, how many developers are here, professionals? Oh, quite a few of you. How many designers? I, wow, there are a few hands. Amazing. Uh, how many of you have worked with designers? Uh, again, a few of you, 20%, 30%. So we have a mix of crowd. Uh, almost like 95% of people have a dev background, engineering background. A few of them are designers. So before we get started, let's create a level playing field, right? Let's understand what design or what UX is uh, for Google or a general concept. And then based on that, we'll build on that and try to see what we do at Google to make sure that we hit the right user experience. Sounds good? Cool. Let's get rolling. So I have uh, less time, so I'll skip a few slides. I'll jump here. Uh, so a good way of explaining what user experience design is by telling, talking about what user experience design is not about. So you guys would have heard a lot of terminologies, interaction design, visual design, user interface, usability. How, how many of you are confused by that? I mean, how many think, hey, they sound very similar. I don't know what these guys do. How do they differ? How many of you are confused by that? Yeah, quite a few of you. So let's start with the first one. User experience design is not just about UI design or usability. That's the first mantra. Why? Because there are so many aspects of a product which we need to take care of apart from just UI or usability. There are emotional aspects which are associated to the product which has to be taken care of and, uh, and similar considerations. Uh, so if you look at the chart, uh, it's a very like grab, but uh, it's, it's a classic example of what Google has been. Till now, Google has always been a company which is focused on speed, which is focused on ease of use, which has always been focused on creating the simplest experience. But one fine day, they realize, hey, you know what? We are not providing the best user experience to our users, right? And probably that's why you would have noticed, uh, like in the last or the last years, we have uh, seen design iterations and changes across all the Google products we have seen. You would have noticed Gmail changing. You would have noticed search changing. You would have noticed maps changing. So that's. The core reason is because we feel that user experience, we need to expand our vision of user experience, not only focus on speed, ease of use, but also focus on much more behavioral and emotional aspects. Uh, this is just uh, a comic strip which kind of illustrates that when we work on a product, uh, there are different considerations in terms of user experience. There are information architects who would be working, there would be visual designers who would be working, there would be usability cons consultants who would be working. And all of them are working on the same product, getting their know-how. And the critical part is that even if one of them doesn't does a good job, the end user experience is messy. So it's very criti critical to have the, uh, these, all these con considerations taken care of properly so that we have a good user experience at the end of it. Uh, second thing, user experience design is not just about the user. And uh, this, is, this is a really, really big consideration because uh, it's also about your business, right? You, there's a limit to which you can think about your user, and there's a limit where you have to start thinking about the business, right? Uh, you have to design something which works equally good for the user as well as it works for your business. So it has to meet your business needs. It also has to meet your technological feasibility aspects. You cannot design anything which is not feasible to construct, right? So as a designer, as a UX designer, we always approach a design, a problem, a product from the desirability aspects. What do people desire in a product? And once we are in a stable stage, we also look at, okay, now this design, is it going to give us the revenue that we have targeted? 
Is it going to, is fulfilling our uh, revenue expectations? At the same time, we also look at, you know, is this design actually feasible to, con uh, to develop? So both of these considerations are there. User experience design is not just about users, it's also about business and technology. Third point, it's not just about, just a step in the process. And this is the biggest misconception. People feel, okay, we have a set of requirements, now we will go, uh, go and give it to the designer, he will come out with mocks, and this is a developable code. No, it doesn't work that way. It cannot be a checkbox. What it needs to be is that it has to be incorporated th throughout the process of product development. Uh, right from the point when you are thinking of a strat strategy for a product, you are defining the scope for a product, you are actually creating a structure uh, based on the content that you have for your website or app, and then you have created skeleton and visual layer and you finally develop it. So, the aspects of user experience design has is evolved in all these uh, layers. Fourth and second last point over here is that user experience design is not the role of one person or department. Uh, everyone feels that user experience is the job of a user experience designer, right? Or the user experience design team or the design team in your organization. It's not true. They might hold the ownership of designing that experience, but you hold the ownership of actually executing that ownership. So, in an organization, user experience is equally owned by the design team, the product team, the front-end team, back-end team, QA team. Everyone owns it equally well. And everyone has to do a more than decently well job to kind of uh, get the right kind of experience at the end of it. Uh, yeah, I mean, this is what happens, generally happens to a, uh, to a user experience designer where, you know what, a product designer who has not thought of the user experience will come and with, to you with a long list of uh, you know, features to be done, and he would not even think about, is it going to be easy for the user to use all these features? So that's the common misconception we have. Lastly, user experience design is not a choice. Right? Uh, you cannot think, hey, you know what, let me focus on pushing it out today. Uh, we'll come back to user experience design in the next release. You can't do that. Because experience happens whether or not you have planned for it. Uh, and when you have not planned for it intentionally, the high chances you will end up with a poor experience. Uh, so to kind of sum up what I was saying, user experience design is not about inner working of a product or service. It's about how it works on the outside, where a person comes in contact to it. So if you are talking about a phone, how does it feel when you hold the phone is user experience. When you use the software on it, how does it feel? That's user experience. When you open the packaging, that's user experience, and when you look at the manuals, that, use, that is user experience. So it spans all across. Cool. Now, now assume that, I assume that we have some sort of common understanding of what user experience could be. Now what I'm gonna do over here is, gonna, I would go through the top 10 design considerations uh, we have as a UX team, and when I say a UX team, Everyone from the developer teams, everyone from the design team, the PM, everyone is involved. And this is, these are the 10 considerations we follow all across Google. Right, so let's get started on this. So the first con consideration that we follow and is very, very critical to Google is focus on the user. This is actually one of the founding principles of Google. Focus on the user and everything else will follow. So what do I mean when I say focus on the user? Uh, what I mean is that whenever there's a discussion going on about a feature, a problem, there has to, there has, the discussion should happen around the user's context. Let me give you a few more examples. Like, you're working on a feature, right? Or you are prioritizing your work for the release. Or you are thinking of implementation details for a particular feature. Those discussions should happen, keeping the user in the center of discussion. Everything else will follow. Uh, prioritize what is best for them. Uh, say, for example, uh, you have to push 20 features uh, this week, and you realize you have only time to finish three features. Which one will you pick? The easiest to implement? How many of you will pick the ones which are easiest to implement? Wow, we have a smart crowd over here. Uh, Will you pick the ones that give you uh, a little more financial benefit? Okay. Uh, what we do at Google is probably we pick the ones that 
is going to be the most helpful feature of the, out of those 20 for the user. We pick those three features uh, which we feel are going to delight the user much more than anything else. Right? Uh, and that is followed by a business uh, decision, and that is followed by the ease of implementation decision. Very critical. Uh, we also try to remove roadblocks uh, from the user's path. Like, you know, any, anything which kind of hinders the user to complete a task, that is taken as, like, upfront. That is the biggest roadblock we need to get it off of the, out of the user's way. Uh, a couple of good techniques we use at Google uh, to ensure that we stay focused on the user uh, are use cases and personas. So how many of you have uh, used use cases or personas earlier? Use cases? Four of you. Personas? Wow. Four of you? OK. So actually, these, the problem is that these terms might sound very fancy, but actually they are very, very straightforward and immensely helpful. Uh, so in all, the use case is just uh, an outline of a piece of functionality, and it also kind of describes how, what are the steps to achieve that functionality. Whereas a persona is an outline of, a, of your user in a much more live way. We'll touch that on these topics in a little detail. Look at this one. So this is what we call a persona. So we uh, create a profile which kind of resembles the kind of users we are going to target. Right? Now, uh, I mean, based on the, our product requirements, we could have one persona, or, be, or we could have more than one persona. Like if I am working on an enterprise app, and my primary user is going to be an account manager. right? So we are looking at the needs of just one kind of person. But if I'm working on a marketing dashboard, where the CMO of a company is going to look at it, the marketing teams would look at it, the sales representatives are going to look at it. Now we're talking about three different set of peoples. These three set of peoples have different wants and needs. So while we are working, if we have these three personas sketched out, you know, it's very helpful in a discussion. You know what? Uh, uh, Robert will, uh, is, a, is, is a heavy social network user. Probably this won't work for him, or this would work for him. So it creates a good understanding of what kind of users you are working for. Uh, people also feel that it's, it's very difficult to create them. Actually, it's not. Uh, if you have understood your users well, uh, you can have a brainstorming session with your team. Uh, just try to look what are the kind of users who are like, like you, who you could identify with as the core users for your product. They become your personas. Uh, this is an example of a very simple use case just mapped out in a Google Docs spreadsheet. Uh, all you can see is, is that there's a very simple title, there's a short description to it, and uh, in the next column we have what are the features that are incorporated in that. So if it's a sign up thing, if the first one is I guess sign up, you have name, username, and blah, 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 a bunch of other things. Why it's very critical? Because once you share this document with your uh, <coughs> dev team or the design team, the designer might come back and comment, you know what, why are we having so many fields uh, for the user? Why do we need so many fields to be filled up? Now, this is very critical. It might sound very trivial. This discussion is very critical at this point of time because uh, the designer would otherwise spend a lot of time to kind of mock things up. He will show it to you, and then you will say, you know what, this doesn't work. Right? So it's a very good point to have these kind of discussions. It always helps to minimize the work uh, from both the design teams and for the engineering team. So always rely on uh, use case documents. Uh, it also helps in kind of, uh, you know, tracking dependencies. So if one use case is dependent on the other one, uh, point that out over here, and that will help you prioritize this list. Uh, second big thing that we do at Google, and it's very uh, essential for us, is think big. Uh, right from the name Google, uh, Think big is like, you know, is in our DNA. Uh, so always be ambitious about the scope of the project you are working on. So even if it's a small idea, uh, even if you think that, you know what, my, even, if, if, even if we develop it, my user segment is going to be like 1,000 or 2,000, but always consider what if it grows to a million users, right? You have to take care of uh, those scenarios. Uh, but you can always argue, you know what, we are a small company, uh, we have a small infrastructure, small server, we cannot think big at this point of time. Fair enough. But for a UX team, it's very critical to think of that larger picture 
and then probably scale down as per your needs. It will be very difficult to think of this experience and scale up, it's always gonna be fractured. So, very critical, uh, be ambitious uh, uh, in your scope. And this also helps in uh, planning things down and up. Uh, provide social hooks. Uh, Saurabh was talking a lot about providing social uh, hooks. Uh, it's very critical. If you have a mechanism for which lets users to express their feedback, uh, like it, plus one, share it, uh, it's immensely useful for you because you know, it not only gets a lot of traffic to your site, it also helps you gather very valuable feedback. And many a times, uh, you know, it's, it's a good platform to, for customer support, right? Uh, sort of mentioned the example of Twitter, uh, uh, the way Angry Bird teams use it. Uh, launch early and iterate. Now, the, the biggest problem about thinking big that many people face is uh, they, get, like, they get drifted by it and they go off track and they lose the, their planning of when to launch a particular product. Uh, I mean, you could be sitting in your uh, you know, bedroom for, for, uh, for years and write the most comprehensive <coughs> mobile app, but uh, if you don't throw it out in the market, you have no idea how the people are gonna react to it. So, uh, even if you have a good, robust product, uh, without all the features that you had planned for, push it out in the market. Let, it'll be very essential for you to see how are people reacting to it. Are there pieces of uh, your product which people are not enjoying or they are completely discarding. This feedback is very helpful in the initial time. So uh, launch early and iterate. And this is something again which is very, very critical to Google because we always launch in beta. We know we do a better job in completing a project once we understand more about how it's being used. So very critical, uh, think big. Uh, this is an example, I mean, you know, if you have a plus one button on your website, uh, for example, it would definitely help you drive traffic and get uh, customer feedback. Uh, third thing, invest time in research. This is probably uh, the most ignored thing uh, everywhere else that I've seen. And I'm really fortunate to be in Google where they kind of really, really emphasize on research. Now, uh, it doesn't need to be a large research. People are scared of it because people think that, you know, we need to invest a lot of time, effort, money in to run, uh, to run a full-fledged research. It's not true. You can do it in a few weeks, and actually you can end up saving months of efforts that would be wasted in, uh, wasted in redoing things. Study the competition very well. Uh, chances are that, are that uh, you know, uh, someone could be uh, developing a similar product maybe in a different uh, industry or marketplace, but always look at the approach that are being followed over there, learn from the experiences. Create a list of the sites you think are your direct competitors or indirect competitors. Uh, be a regular user, do a lot of research on the sites, and learn uh, what you can uh, learn from them. How, where are they failing? Uh, this is something, again, we do a lot in Google. Uh, uh, next point is, uh, you know, uh, create quick prototypes. Uh, or and validate assumptions with friends. Uh, so you don't need to hire a researcher for that. Everyone has friends, uh, relatives, colleagues, and their friends. Feel free to bounce off your ideas, your designs uh, with those people. It's never too early to share these ideas and gather feedback. And Saurabh has been, uh, in the previous session, uh, reiterating again and again that feedback is very crucial when you're developing a product. Uh, it could be a very simple conversation, actually. Now, uh, imagine if I'm creating an online shopping experience. Uh, I can just ask people, okay, would you like to see all the products that I have on the homepage? Or would you like to see just the new products that are being launched? Or would you like to see uh, the most uh, popular ones, also the, the new ones? So, I mean, these kind, of, these kind of questions, which are very, very simple and basic in nature, uh, could be good starting points for a user research that you can own and run. Uh, create quick prototypes. You don't need to invest like weeks and weeks in uh, you know, prototyping things uh, in HTML, CSS. Pick the technology that's the easiest to pick. Pick Flash, pick anything else. We generally rely on paper and PowerPoint or Keynote. Uh, we create mocks, uh, test them with users. 
I'll be covering that in a minute. Uh, like this one. So this is a prototype of a website. This is how we start. You know, the whole website is on post-its. Uh, this is a shopping uh, site. You have the product titles over there. You have daily special, customer profile. On the left, you have the navigation. And at the top, you have the branding. Now, how does it benefit? Firstly, post-its are there, so you can easily reposition them. So I showed it to a user and said, you know what, I want the daily special to come up. You know, when I go to the site, I should always see the daily special. Fair enough, it goes up. No time wasted, split second. Uh, I can, someone says, you know what, I need this special feature. Okay, you need this feature, here it is. Right? So if you run this, and since it's very quick, you can do this with like, you know, 30, 40, 50 people, you, number of people you have access to. And this feedback is very, very critical. So we never go to high-end prototyping, high-fidelity pro prototyping till the testing stage. We, after this, we move to a stage where we sketch things on paper. After that, we move to a stage where we are prototyping some PowerPoint or Keynote. And till then, we, have, we are pretty sure that whatever we are doing, users are going to like that. So this is very critical prototyping and low fidelity prototyping. Uh, fourth is go for gold. You know, uh, the first impression counts. So the first time the user comes to your site, it's the best opportunity you'll get, ever get to make them like what you have done, to explain them how you can help them, to serve them with whatever purpose your site or product is meant for. Uh, really think about the first engagement as it's very valuable uh, to the user. Uh, it creates a good impression, make sure that, you know, uh, just make sure that they understand what your product is for and what uh, you're offering them. Uh, demonstrate trust and inspire confidence. So, I mean, I don't know, many times you would have seen, you would have gone to a site where there are terms and conditions, the checkbox is already selected, right? Uh, that kind of gives an impression to people that, you know what, these guys are hiding something from me. Whereas the person, the designer would have thought, you know what, I'm saving a click over here. Please don't do that. User's trust is more important than a click. Let them believe that you're very transparent, which you, I guess you are. So, uh, trust and uh, confidence. Uh, start a dialogue with your user. So, after you've created the right trust, it's very important to start a dialogue so that uh, you are in constant touch with the user. You never lose them, right? How to do that? We'll come to that. Uh, this is a good example how Android uh, does the, you know, the, the first impression that I was talking about. So when you kind of uh, uh, start your new phone, you have to do a bunch of things, location settings, service settings, uh, language, and you know, bunch of things. So the designers have made sure have tried and they've prototyped it n number of times just to make sure that this whole experience is seamless and makes you feel that this is, you know, it's fairly easy and I'm enjoying it. Whereas it's, it's like a cumbersome job. Uh, I was talking about, uh, uh, you know, uh, starting conversation. Uh, add to circle, Google circle, or any other social medium is a very good way to uh, start a conversation. Now, you should make sure that it's not intrusive. So suppose your website allows the users to kind of, uh, you know, give them, uh, give uh, their email IDs to you, thank them, uh, reply back to them. Uh, also mention that, hey, would you like to follow us on this, 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 and this. Uh, because once they kind of start, uh, are in your circle or following you, it's a good uh, platform where you can tell them, update them every time you are changing the product for them. Fifth, uh, and we are almost halfway through. And this is something, uh, people at Google understand better than anything else, speed. Uh, and, and people are so, so, uh, I'll say emotional about this, that you know, thousands and thousands of experiments have been run on the Google homepage, and they have realized that uh, even by a change in speed of hundredth of a second, we see more user engagement on the Google homepage. So, Speed is very important to Google. Uh, but if you realize a lot of the speed is beyond our control because, uh, I mean, the user could be used on a, you know, a slow network or there would be congestion between the server and the network. So a lot of times things are beyond our control. 
but there are still things that we can do from our side, which is design the sites, the apps, in a way that they are very light. Right? Again, I'll be coming to that uh, in a second. Uh, so you, you need to avoid unnecessary clutter. Uh, you need to look at every element of the page and think, hey, what purpose is this serving? Is it really needed there, or can I get rid of it over here? Uh, optimize the page and elements and the layout of the page. Uh, I guess uh, someone is going to talk about optimization in depth. Um, maybe someone has already talked about it. Uh, last, a second last point is very critical, and people, designers generally don't think about it, is muscle memory. Now, that sounds like a weird concept, muscle memory, what has to do, it to do with UI? But how many times have you pushed a door when pull was written? How many times? Oh my goodness, a lot of you. Uh, it, it's, it's not because you are doing something wrong, it's because it's designed wrong, right? It's because your hand is trained in uh, pushing the door even, uh, and it does it so fast that before your eyes read pull, send it to the brain, the brain sends you the, your hand instruction that you have to pull the door, you've already pushed it, right? That happens in UI as well. I'll be talking about example in a second. Uh, create uh, personalization opportunities. Uh, other way we try to make it uh, sites very fast is we try to help people personalize things. Like, I mean, one very small example could be like, people like, uh, you know, Gmail in a different layout every time. So if we help them save that particular layout, uh, so they don't need to come every time, log in Gmail, go back to the layout. So those small personalization aspects are very critical. Uh, I was talking about, uh, you know, uh, speed of, uh, of site, how, how fast the site loads up. It's a very critical aspect of, uh, uh, user experience. So how many of you have sites with, with these loaders? Seriously? Oh, man. I, 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 I really have a personal bias against this uh, because uh, it comes in the way of user experience. It could have been a technology choice for you, but who cares? Right? If it makes the user wait for 40 seconds before they get to see the content in your site, it's not done. So try and move to a better technology, or make it so light that uh, uh, you know, people can easily access. OK, a quiz for you. Tell me what's wrong on this page. Currency is wrong? OK. Sorry? OK. OK. Okay. The problem over here, I mean, and this is a real life example. I'm kind of currently working on this. Uh, there was 80% drop off on this page. Right? And you know why? Because the cancel button was in the place of continue button. Wondered why? Because we always feel back, I mean, the back button will be the left hand side. Uh, the uh, continue button is going to be the right hand side, right? So even before anyone could realize, hey, that's cancel, you've already clicked on it thinking it's continue. You're out of the flow, right? So muscle memory, very important. Always follow the mental model that exists. Uh, like in a couple of sites, you'll see, you know, uh, to go back, you have to click on the logo. Follow a consistent men mental model. Uh, uh, position buttons, action items in the place where people expect them to be, right? Uh, very critical. Okay, don't make the users do a lot of work. Now, see, uh, a user comes to your product after, I mean, it's a choice for them. I mean, they, they would have preferred your product over several other products. We at Google try to respect that and try to ensure that once they are on our products, you started using our products, we minimize the effort that they, need, that they need to continue using that product. Uh, so, so, uh, so as you design and you know, implement your site, uh, there could be a couple of considerations that you can uh, keep in mind to, uh, you know, to re reduce the amount of effort that the user takes. Firstly, prioritize the content. Now, you know, uh, 
pages can have varied uh, level of uh, or quant uh, quantity of content on the page. They could be pages which have like long scrolls. Uh, so if you have prioritized the content well, kept the important ones at uh, critical, uh, uh, crucial positions where people uh, have a tendency to look. And the secondly, the tertiary information could be kind of treated accordingly. It helps users to kind of uh, figure out uh, the important information, and which is fine. Even if they miss the tertiary ones, that's fine. Uh, clear, uh, define clear sections. So if you have a lot of information, it's always good to have, uh, to break that information into small chunks, call them out as clear sections, so that people can pick up, okay, this is relevant to me, and this two, these two are not. So probably I'll just focus on that. So help them uh, pick the content that they would be more interested in uh, in this fashion. Follow conventions and ensure consistency. I was talking, given an example where, you know, you can click on the logo and go back. You know, if you are doing that across uh, your site, uh, I mean, do that on every page. I mean, it shouldn't happen that, you know, one page, it's not working. Uh, so follow the con uh, these convention. Uh, always ask for what you really need. Uh, for example, and the best example is uh, our form fields. You know, when we ask, uh, as a designer or a developer, when we try to, uh, you know, uh, let the user sign up for something, we feel that's our chance to grab all the information possible from them. You know, ask them their father's name, mother's name, when they were born, what time were they born, which hospital were they born, right? Please don't do that. Uh, one of my favorite examples of, uh, uh, you know, the quickest sign up is Tumblr. How many of you on Tumblr? Wow. It is so easy, three steps, and you have your blog. You have a web page. How, how easy can it get, right? So take, ask users for information which is like really, really critical to start, uh, for uh, helping them start using the product, and gradually you can ask for more information as and when needed. People will, people will be open to give that, that's what we have seen. Uh, so, so if you notice what we have been doing, we have been trying to follow a sequence. So uh, we talked about what to ask from the user, right? Uh, now we'll talk about what to speak to the user, right? Very critical again, uh, because you might have an amazing uh, UI, amazing visual design, but if the content over there is confusing, uh, doesn't mean anything, you would always be confused. Like the previous example I was showing, there was someone who said there's no commitment plan with something or something, something, right? That was because the language was confusing. Everything was fine. It was a simple interaction, uh, select the radio buttons, hit the next, you are on, right? But because of the language, uh, people get confused in taking or making a decision. So refine and iterate the idea, uh, uh, the terminologies. Measure user uh, comprehension. How do you do that? Uh, the best way that we use is that, suppose we are creating tabs, right? We make cards, mention the tab names on each card, show it to people, okay, what does this mean, right? Uh, so it gives us an idea what are the common perceptions around that word. So this would avoid scenarios where you have a help tab and you go and click on that and it's asking you to donate to a charity. So uh, that's something uh, that, so we have uh, content writers for that. We are kind of, uh, we have a content writing team. But if you're a smaller organization, you can always look for a friend who can help you, uh, you know, with this. And if you're working on products which are related to global uh, geographies, uh, do get it checked uh, with a native speaker. Uh, this is one of my favorite example. Uh, it comes from, uh, you know, Google Store Builder. Now, if you look at the language, they are doing a bunch of things. Firstly, they are kind of very, uh, they are welcoming you, and they are telling you that you're just one step closer to kind of setting up your website online. So that, that statement just, you know, it psychologically makes me feel, hey, I'm almost there, right? Then it says we can uh, help you get started. We just need you to answer these basic questions. So it ensures that we are gonna help them throughout the process. And if you like, look at the questions, they are, they're framed in a way that as if I'm talking to you, right? If you look at the examples over there, they give you a good idea of what kind of content is suitable over here, right? So, and definitely it has the number of characters that uh, could be incorporated in those text box. 
So overall, it gives me a good idea of, uh, uh, you know, what I'm going to do, what I'm expected to do, and how fast I can do it. Now, this is something, this is one of my favorite examples, how not to do terminology. So this is an error message. And there are a bunch of things that are wrong in this error message. To start with, it has a confirm button. Now, why do you need a confirm button on an error message, right? It has a code. Maybe it could be useful for the engineer, but why do I care what that code means, right? And the biggest of all, you know, it says, you know, no SIM card or phone is turned off. Then why am I seeing this error, right? So these, these small instances would create an impression that probably you're not taking enough care in creating this product. So take care of these small instances. Huh, eight point, we almost there. Test everything you can. And I mean, you guys, you guys would have read about it, heard about it. We do a lot of testing on products. Uh, so suppose you're on a stage where you have kind of, uh, uh, you had already sketched out things, you had run some research on that, you incorporated feedback that you got through the research. The developing, the developing teams have already uh, kind of created, you know, a rough cut uh, uh, UI. So the best thing to do is invite your friends for lunch or dinner, right? And make them bakras. Make them test your apps. Make them test your websites. Uh, tell them that, you know what, this is work in progress. There might be things uh, which are not working. There could be things which are working. But uh, do share with them. Uh, also keep in mind that uh, avoid being a little more emotional. Um, what happens is that you, you have worked really hard on this, uh, in this particular design or app. And once, uh, if someone gives a feedback, hey, you know what, nahi hai. And you don't take it personally. Uh, if someone says that, keep that in mind. Do go and check with someone else. Hey, are you facing the same problem? If it's a, if you get to hear the same problem is arising like number of times, then there's definitely something wrong with your design. You have to go back to the drawing board. Uh, track bugs. So I mean, tracking bug is definitely the job of a program manager. But as a designer, I also track bugs. I track design bugs. Why do I do that? Uh, I have a list of say 50 design bugs. Every release, maybe five of them are getting incorporated, right? But the rest of them are not getting incorporated. No one is creating that list, hey, uh, UI-related bugs. It's my responsibility as a designer. So that I know that these are the pending UI-related issues which needs to be fixed. So as a designer, I mean, this is personal designer uh, over here that do create uh, a bug tracker for yourself. Just create a Google Doc spreadsheet. That will help. Try and break things. Uh, very interesting. Uh, if you have uh, your uh, app or website running, try and break it. Uh, because you have no idea users uh, are going to use in, in what way. Uh, a couple of years back, I worked on a mobile app. And we had a feature where you can shake and the data is refreshed. We got uh, feedback from Mumbai that your app is amazing, it works amazing at home and office, it doesn't work in local trains. And we kept thinking, why, how come it's not working local trains, why local trains? And then we realized probably it was the shake, we had kept it so sensitive that uh, it wasn't working. So try and see when your UI breaks. If there's a telephone number field, try to uh, uh, punch in el uh, uh, alphabets over there, try to punch it more than 10 characters, see how it responds, does it throw an error message? So try and break things. Uh, test against your use cases. So if you remember, we had started with use cases. Uh, once you have something running, keep it next to the use cases. Check if everything is there which you had initially planned for. Right? Many a times in the flow of things, you miss out a very critical use case, and you're like, oh, damn, we don't have this, and tomorrow you have to release this. So always keep tracking with uh, use cases. Are we meeting all the use case requirements or not? This is just a small example that uh, how we do it. Uh, it's just a fake one. So you know, uh, so these are the problems arising. These are the priority level. These are sections. Uh, what is the status on it? So we do it as a designer too. Ninth, 
be ready to offer a helping uh, hand. Now, you would have imagined that we, we, have, we have developed a brilliant app or an amazing site, but there's still 100% chance and there will be a lot of people who won't get it. Right? How do you address that? In cases like that, when, when you are testing it out, when you have done your research, you, have, you would already identify that there are certain aspects of your product where people get confused about. Right? So to kind of cater that, always try and give a contextual help. Uh, and that is something you might, uh, get, you might be seeing in Google or you would get to see in Google uh, very soon is that uh, if there's, a, there's some action that has been performed over here, we'll see related help items on the right-hand side. So anything we feel that you could have a problem with, the help is there on that page, very contextual. Try doing that. Uh, write and update FAQs. Uh, we maintain an amazing, amazing uh, FAQs and help uh, if you have visited either of uh, any of Google's help. Uh, a good way to do is when you are doing research, when you're doing testing, keep account of every question that the user has asked you. Right? Why have you done this? The user might ask you, why is the button over here? I could not find the button, right? Or how do I sign up? These are, a, these are very good FAQ questions, right? Because what happens if we have not, uh, if we haven't like, you know, kept the record of that, the day you'll sit and uh, to write FAQs, you'll start from zero, okay. Now, what would be the question that users will ask, right? Don't do that. When you're doing research, keep a track of all the questions that the users are asking you. Solicit feedback. Uh, so if your product's already out, or it's about to get out. Uh, feedback is very critical. Uh, you can use uh, all the regular channels that are present uh, socially, or you can have something embedded in your site where, which helps people to give feedback. Uh, we'll be talking about that a little more uh, in a while. Be responsive to inquiries. Uh, again, a very important aspect of user experience because, uh, like, I know YouTube does it very well. You post a feedback and they'll get back to you, hey, thank you so much for the feedback. We already considering this feedback and we'll get back to you, you know, with whatever is the decision that we've taken. It just gives you a feel, hey, that there are people who are taking care about me. So if you're work working on an app and uh, you are uh, very prompt in replying this to those queries, people will consider it as a part of a good user experience. Uh, this is a FAQ example from uh, Google Trader, I guess, and uh, if you look at it, you know, these questions are framed in a way, they're very general in nature, right? Like question the how do I post an item to sell? I could have also uh, framed the question as, are you having problem, are you facing problems selling the app? Uh, but there's a difference of tone in the two. The second case, I'm kind of trying to tell the user that you are facing a problem, Right? You are not able to do it properly. Right? That's a negative tone. Let's keep a very neutral tone. Let's make it a Q&A where you're not. Uh, are you facing problems? This is how you, you should go about doing it. So uh, yeah, have FAQs and uh, make it as, make the tone much more neutral and try to answer as many questions as you can. Uh, another good, good example of feedback mechanism is uh, something that you can see in the G Plus mobile app for Series 64. Uh, you have a feedback button over there. If you feel like giving a feedback or a certain feature, you click that button and you, you move to this UI where you see, you know, things already there. You have to just select the radio button. Why? Because it's really tough to type things on a mobile, um, a mobile screen. So what we do over here is that we keep collecting feedbacks and we keep stack ranking them. So uh, the once that feature in the stack rank are shown here as radio buttons, so if there are certain things where people are facing more and more problems, those items will, all, will definitely appear over here. And then there's definitely a place where you can give any extra comments that you want. So reduce the effort that the user would take in giving you any kind of feedback. Lastly, analyze usage. We were talking about Google Analytics a while back. If you have a website, if you have a mobile app, you need to have proper instrumentation done across the site. Why it helps? Because it helps you study patterns of use. You know where the users are entering from. You know what the users, how much time users are spending on what page. Where are they exiting and, or where are they dropping off from? Uh, this pattern is very critical to kind of uh, understand uh, 
understand where, uh, where is a problem. Sometimes these numbers are a good identification into the exact problem that's happening. Sometimes they are just a hint that there could be a problem on this page and then probably you have to go back and run some small research to figure out what exactly is the problem. Cool, so these were the 10 considerations that we have in Google, so let's summarize. Focus on user, think big, invest time in research, please do that. Uh, look for the first impression, try to get a, a loyal customer in your first interaction with them. Uh, design for speed, uh, don't make the end user work uh, when it's actually not required, prioritize that thing. Uh, use a language to communicate with the user which they can easily understand and which is, doesn't have a negative tone to it. Uh, test everything you can. This is, I mean, I mean we do it every day. Uh, and you would have heard a lot of stories about testing at Google. Uh, be ready to offer a helping hand and analyze usage. So, top four that I can think of. What do I understand about my user? very critical. How can I give them more pleasure to my users? And uh, third important point is that am I creating a seamless experience across my product? Or my, the product design of my phone is amazing, but the software is not that good, right? It should be seamless. Uh, and if we are creating a, you know, a, a environment for the user where they can enjoy and they can have fun, they like, I'm sure uh, this enthusiasm will turn out into profit for you guys. So that was the presentation for, from me. Thank you so much. Uh, if you folks, uh, many of you are students over, there, over here, so if you guys are interested in learning a little more about interaction design or UX design, this is a good source to go to and you'll find a bunch of books over here. Uh, there is also this course being run by Stanford. Uh, it's a five-week course, people who don't like reading books. Uh, it's an online course, you can go and watch videos. There's gonna be a quiz after that and you would get a certification from Stanford. Any questions if you have? We'd love to answer them. Please. Uh, we kindly request you all to walk towards the mic stand. Thank you. Hi, uh, this is uh, Nilesh. Uh, what products does uh, Google have for designing? Uh, products in the sense? Like to make user interfaces or uh, best practices which are already there, we can just pick and uh, choose and create uh, better pages or better uh, screens. Uh, so, uh, if you're using Android, uh, the whole specification of the design, Android design is available on site. You can go to android.developer.android.com slash design. You will get to know everything about that's related to design for Android from fonts to paddings to uh, colors to styles, everything is gonna be there. So, uh, most of these products maintain their own uh, vocabulary and they are available in uh, these product specific sites. But if you're looking for a specific tool to come up with UIs, uh, no, that's not something that Google invests. Like we have Pencil for the Android thing, so do you have anything specific from oh, Google? Those are, those are much of an app. I won't consider them as like tools which Google offers uh, to U UX guys. So you would find definitely find a lot of apps online uh, you will have OmniGraphle and Balsamic, which you can go and download on your phones and uh, 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 tablets, and you can use them for UI, wireframing, mockups, everything. But nothing from Google as such? No. Okay. Nothing I, that I know of. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Yeah. Hi, this is Anshul from Triple IT. Mm -hmm. uh, you were talking about making the user experience friendly and enthusiastic. So I have this question, like sometimes you want to tell the user so much in just one page, like Yahoo. It is all those updates coming up here and there. But then you want it to make it easy for the user like Google. It just has one search box. So how do you, you know, evaluate that? What is, what do you want to show and what you should show exactly? Good question. Interestingly, I used to work with Yahoo before Google. Uh, 
So you need to understand that Yahoo and Google are, they are trying to, uh, they are two different aspects. Uh, Yahoo is all about content. You know, it's like, you know, the earliest days of internet, where it was a hypertext system, they were content, 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 everything was connected by hyperlinks, you can actually serve through these contents, right? Yahoo is pretty much still the same. You have content pieces, uh, lots of content which people love reading, and they spend a lot of time moving from one article to the other, reading those stuff, right? Come to Google. Google kind of falls into the second phase of internet development where internet moved from a hypertext system to a software model, right? So earlier, you could see a railway schedule on website. Now you could book tickets from websites, right? Earlier, you could see stock quotes. Now you can actually go and you know, buy or sell stocks. So there's a, there's a shift from uh, web as, as a hypertext system to web as a software system. Google more or less operates in the area of uh, software systems. They do have products which are much more content heavy. Uh, but if you look at Gmail, Maps, uh, other apps that we have, they are more or less softwares, right? And so the design considerations that we uh, use at Google are a little different from what we uh, use at Yahoo, what I used to use at Yahoo. Actually, I should, I skipped a few slides because uh, uh, my time was cut short by 15 minutes. Uh, this would help you, yep. Uh, maybe next one, right? So if you can see over there, uh, you had lots of content on as, you know, when web was more like a hypertext system. So if you look at LA Times, New York Times, Yahoo, all, the, all of them are content heavy sites. Their main intention is to kind of structure this content, make people navigate from the content, right? Uh, come to software uh, interface side where think of an app like Google, uh, sorry, like uh, Gmail, where you would have, have hardly have 50, 60 pages, but the focus is on minor interactions that you generally have with the software. So that's, that's the reason why you might find uh, Yahoo to be text heavy uh, and Google to be light. Uh, and uh, coming back to your question, uh, you know, what it takes to make it heavy or light, it all, so the answer is that it depends on what you're trying to do. If you're trying to create a content site, Facebook is a content site, it's always gonna look heavy, right? But if you're trying to create a software where there's a box, you punch in a word and hit enter, you get the result, that's always gonna be light. 